Good evening. Um, welcome to the uh, discussion tonight on traumatic brain injury. I'm Jim Aiken. I'm the uh, CEO of the Keystone Symposia that many of you know about, but not everybody. I won't take the time to talk about Keystone Symposia, except to say that we bring a lot of quite well-known scientists to this community, uh, but often the people in the community don't know about that. And we, have, we hold about 55 conferences a year. About 18 of them are here in this county. And right now we have two conferences going on at the same time at Keystone, one on Alzheimer's disease and one on uh, traumatic uh, brain injury. And so we thought that the, it would be nice if the community could have a chance to hear a little bit about a topic that is kind of um, very current in the newspapers and things. And we have some distinguished people here, and I'm going to introduce them briefly. They're probably each going to speak for a relatively short period of time, and then we'll have some questions. But since there's uh, a group, we, we will try and get right, on, right going. And one, um, one of our guests is Dr. Jeffrey Barth, which is there. He's a professor of clinical psychology and the co-director of the Neurocognitive Assessment Laboratory um, at the uh, University of Virginia, brain, um, uh, brain Injury and Sports uh, Concussion Institute. Uh, Stephen Dukoski is the uh, Vice President and Dean at the University of Virginia School of Medicine and Professor in the Department of Neurology, and he does research on structural and neurochemical changes in <laughs> normal aging and in dementia, as well as the effects of traumatic brain injury on the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Excuse me, I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> and. Uh, John Feeney is a local physician who uh, is at Colorado Mountain Medical in Edwards, and uh, we invited him to come along because he actually sees the type of injuries that occur in this community and sees perhaps a couple of mild cases of traumatic brain injury every day, I guess. And then next to, next to me is Kevin uh, Giskowitz. Kevin is the uh, chair of the Department of Exercise and Sports Science at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He's uh, also the founding director of the Matthew Geffler Sports Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center. And so since we don't have lots of time, I think we'll get started uh, with uh, Kevin. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what I thought I'd talk about tonight uh, is uh, preventing concussion in sport and uh, sort of the subtitle of from the from the lab to the law. And uh, a lot of my work at the University of uh, North Carolina for the past uh, 17 years has focused on trying to put uh, tools in the hands of clinicians, physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, whomever might be out there on the front lines managing this injury. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of that, talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we've been doing, and then uh, sort of wrap it up with uh, the new concussion laws, of which I know there's one here in, in the state of Colorado, uh, one of 34 states now that has a, a concussion law uh, uh, aimed at preventing uh, catastrophic outcome in uh, youth uh, athletes. So I like to oftentimes start with the, this sort of concussion equation, as I call it. And if you, uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the research that's been done over the past uh, decade, 15 years, has focused on clinical outcome on measures such as tracking symptoms, tracking neurocognitive function. Uh, Dr. Barth is, is one of the, the leaders in this area. He started, was the first uh, neuropsychologist to, to actually uh, conduct a study, uh, a prospective study in uh, athletes, uh, taking uh, his tools to the sideline. And uh, we lear we've learned an awful lot about that. Uh, I then trained under Dr. Barth at, at Virginia several years ago and uh, with the focus of combining neurocognitive testing with balance testing and trying to use balance as, a, as, as an additional measure of uh, of recover, recovery following concussion. And uh, I think it's safe to say that we've done a great job, uh, not just uh, Dr. Barth and myself, but a number of other uh, researchers uh, at various institutions in trying to help take the guesswork, if you will, out of concussion management by uh, putting these objective tools that are sensitive for uh, tracking uh, concussion. Uh, and then 
a lot of what we're spending the, the, the next several days on uh, at the conference center down the road is looking at the chronic effects, looking at the effects of uh, uh, post-concussion syndrome, uh, depression, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, as uh, long-term uh, consequences of this injury. Uh, more recently, I've been focused on sort of the left-hand side of the equation that you can see here, which is the biomechanics. Uh, we've placed accelerometers in the players of our, uh, in the helmets of our athletes at the University of North Carolina. We've been tracking the frequency, the magnitude, and the location uh, of these impacts to try to better understand uh, how we can help prevent these injuries. We use this, these technologies to, to try to show an athlete how they're uh, perhaps blocking or tackling inappropriately. So I think that this will help guide uh, uh, the, the the way in which we, we make rules changes in various sports and the kickoff rule I mentioned this morning in my lecture uh, was changed in the NFL this year because of some of our work and they moved the kickoff up five yards uh, so we're seeing more touchbacks so there are fewer collisions taking place on kickoffs and we found out last week uh, at a meeting that I attended at, at the NFL headquarters that we saw a 42% reduction in the number of concussions on kickoffs this year in the NFL. So it's just one example of how we can utilize these tools uh, to, to, to make positive changes. And, um, and then there's a lot out there about the biomarkers and the acute uh, uh, sort of treatment uh, interventions that we might think about, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, hyperbaric oxygen saturation, uh, progesterone treatments. There's still a lot to be done in this area. So I always caution parents, coaches, and athletes that uh, be careful. There's a lot of false advertising out there that if you read anything about these three uh, potential interventions, uh, ask that salesman uh, to show you the science because in many cases it doesn't exist. Just a few things about how often concussions occur. <clears throat> we see upwards of 3 million sport-related uh, and uh, organized sport-related concussions in a given year, and that's a report from the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And emergency visits have increased 200% for children and adolescents uh, just in the last five years. And I think that that has a lot to do with the awareness. There's, a, there's a, more of a public awareness about concussion where uh, the state laws are, are forcing us to educate uh, coaches, parents, athletes about signs and symptoms, so we're seeing more reporting. I'm not convinced that there are actually more concussions occurring today uh, than what we saw 10 or 15 years ago, but I think we're just doing a better job of managing them. And uh, football does have the highest concussion rates in, in all sports, but I do uh, always emphasize that, that we see concussions in all sports. Uh, we actually had a cross-country runner at UNC several years back uh, that was hit by a deer on the cross-country course. And uh, the local Elks Club gave him an honorary membership uh, as a result. So um, uh, we always, I always tell our, our students to expect the unexpected. Uh, you never know. Uh, how should I refer to the injury? Uh, these are brain injuries. And so when I have a coach that tells me, well, uh, my athletes just had a bell ringer or a ding, I say, you mean a brain injury. And I would encourage you to think about these as, as such. These are, these are brain injuries. When we begin to use terminology such as a bell ringer and dings, we trivialize that injury. And uh, it, it can be mismanaged as a result of that. Uh, we tend not to, to grade these much anymore. We used to have a grading scale. There were several, probably 20, I think 23 reported, uh, 23 uh, grading scales in the, in the literature uh, at one time on different ways to grade these. And now here we are in 2012 where we're not even really grading them. Uh, we're focusing more on the recovery of, of those three factors I mentioned earlier, symptoms, their neurocognitive function, and balance. So uh, that's just uh, uh, some of the work that's been done. Why do we want to be careful and why, do, why are we so concerned about the, these injuries? Well, uh, we have to think about what are the short-term risks of mismanaging this injury as well as the long-term risks of mismanaging uh, the, this injury. Uh, what are the risks of not reporting? 50 percent, uh, this is a published paper from 2005, 50 percent of all high school football concussions go unreported, therefore undiagnosed. And this puts an athlete at risk for uh, post-concussion syndrome, where symptoms can last beyond uh, three weeks. Uh, repeat concussions with post-concussion syndrome, so recurrent concussions. Uh, School-related issues uh, for the student athlete and something called second impact syndrome where uh, fortunately we see very few of these in, in a given year, uh, but it's, they typically occur in athletes under the age of 18 where they return to play while they're still symptomatic and uh, they take a second insult to the head and the brain loses its ability to self-regulate the blood supply and this massive swelling takes place in the brain and uh, without proper care and quick uh, emergency 
uh, you know, sort of referral to emergency department and, and to a neurosurgical unit where they can relieve that pressure, uh, that uh, that young athlete uh, w w will die. And 50% of the cases of this, they, they do die. The good news is that uh, we we track these injuries through our through our center at UNC, and we only see eight to ten of these a year now. So, so, but, but if you're one of the family member of one of those eight to ten, certainly uh, this is of concern. What are the long-term risks of mis mismanaging this? Um, just uh, all the factors I've mentioned before: depression, cognitive impairment, uh, dementia. Uh, CTE is now being considered uh, as a potential late-life consequence of uh, not only concussive injuries but uh, repetitive sub uh, subconcussive insults to the head. Uh, decreased quality of life, uh, and again, long-term academic issues and, and uh, also problems in the workplace. So just very important that we manage these. Uh, what do we want to know about helmets? Well, uh, there are there is no concussion-proof helmet, and uh, I probably get uh, two calls a week from a parent asking uh, to, to make a recommendation on the concussion-proof helmet for their son or daughter uh, who has just sustained their second or third concussion. And... Um, uh, I tell them they should probably go find a, a helmet that looks good on the golf course uh, because uh, there's no helmet that's going to prevent uh, concussion. They do a great job of preventing catastrophic injuries such as skull fractures and uh, rupturing blood vessels and things of that nature. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time they do a great job with that, uh, but they can't do that. Uh, the materials can't pr protect the brain from, from those sort of um, um, severe uh, uh, acceleration, deceleration injuries uh, and prevent skull fractures while also softening that insult to, to mitigate the forces that we see with concussions inside the brain. So uh, most important is a properly fitted helmet, properly worn helmet and a helmet that's in good condition and is NOXI certified uh, with a stamp on the back uh, and a boss seal on the back uh, is what's really important to think about. Uh, this is a, you know, if I don't have a headache anymore, does that mean I'm okay? Well, not really, because uh, we have found through our research um, that significant memory deficits uh, can show up 36 hours post-injury uh, in athletes who have claimed to be symptom-free within 15 minutes of their injury. Been a number of studies published on this. This is one by Mark Lovell at the University of Pittsburgh uh, from several years ago, and in a paper that we published in JAMA a few years back, found that uh, one third of all athletes uh, that had a concussion and returned to play on the same day because they had talked their athletic trainer or their physician or their coach into to going back because they weren't uh, experiencing symptoms any longer, uh, that, that, that they ended up developing, uh, one third of them ended up developing uh, symptoms three hours after that injury. So uh, when in doubt, sit them out. That sort of is our motto that we use and it seems to work well. Uh, as we look at tracking of recovery, uh, tracking of symptoms, uh, which is really important, and we utilize in our clinic and most of the clinics around the country use what's called a graded symptom checklist so we can grade the severity uh, and the different types of uh, symptoms uh, because it's not just about headache, blurred vision, and dizziness. There are a lot of other uh, signs and symptoms that come with concussion, uh, such as sleep disorders. Um, cognitive issues that I've already mentioned, memory impairment, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light. So there's a whole host of these, and it's important to sort of work through a checklist to be sure that we're not missing anything. But what we found is that for most high school uh, athletes, uh, it'll take uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 days on average for those symptoms to resolve. Uh, we do see a small percentage, about 5 to 8 percent, where they'll uh, develop this post-concussion syndrome where those symptoms last beyond three weeks. Uh, in the collegiate and professional athletes, uh, they have, uh, they're not as likely to have a longer uh, or protracted recovery. Uh, they tend to recover within 7 to 10 days on average. But again, there certainly are exceptions to this. Most repeat within season or most within season repeat concussions uh, will occur within the initial 7 to 10 days after the injury. So we think there's still uh, some uh, neuronal vulnerability that take, that, that's, that's there uh, following that injury. Um, we also know that athletes that have had a concussion are at a significant risk for uh, subsequent injuries. So this is a study that we published in, in 2003 uh, that found that uh, athletes that had one prior concussion, diagnosed concussion, in the five years leading up to their um, uh, to, to, leading up to the, the current season, that they were at, at a one-and-a-half-fold risk of a subsequent concussion compared to an athlete that never had a concussion. Uh, that player that had three or more concussions uh, in the five years leading up to that uh, season uh, was at a three-and-a-half-fold risk. 
of uh, a subsequent concussion. So there, there's a sort of a dose response that the more you, you know, the more concussions you've had, the more likely you are to have another one. So we think that the threshold for injury has been lowered. Far too many headlines such as this, uh, New York Times uh, headline, high school players shrug off concussions, raising, this is raising the risks. And uh, this has uh, been a very serious uh, problem. Uh, Alan Schwartz, uh, a writer for the New York Times, spent about five, six years researching this topic. And this is one quote that he shared with me uh, that, uh, that, that came from an athlete. Uh, it's not dangerous to play with a concussion. You've got to sacrifice for the sake of the team. The only way I come out is on a stretcher. And Alan has a, a, an entire um, um, a binder full of quotes like this. And we, we need to change this culture. And this is what I think the state laws are going to do. How did the state laws begin? And I'll just sort of wrap this up here so we can move on to the other speakers. But this all started in 2006 with a case in Washington State called Zach Le the, the Zach, Zach Leistet law was, was um, uh, essentially came about because Zachary Leistet, a 13-year-old middle school football player, uh, had a, a, an injury uh, in the first half of a game, just three plays before halftime, did not experience loss of consciousness, and that's another take-home point for you. Less than 10% of all concussions involve a loss of consciousness. So there's still a lot of people out there that think if their son or daughter hasn't lost consciousness, then they haven't had a concussion, and that's just not true. Zach didn't lose consciousness. Uh, there was a timeout. He was removed, went to, to the, um, off under the bleachers for halftime with his team, returned at the start of the third quarter, uh, continued to play in the third and fourth quarter, and then Zach collapsed at the end of the game into his dad's arms, and his life was never the same. He sustained the second impact syndrome that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, where he had this massive uh, diffuse cerebral edema uh, that fortunately they were close enough to a hospital in Seattle where they were able to go in and uh, take the, the top of his skull off to relieve the pressure and uh, provide medications that allowed to, to sort of resolve some of the pressure there. Uh, long story short, uh, Zach uh, just recently started walking again, and this injury occurred October 12th of 2006. Uh, the law uh, was created. That was the first state law. Now there are 34, and I'll show you in a second here. But uh, I credit Stan Herring, who's a good friend of mine, a physician at the uh, University of Washington out in Seattle, uh, and the team physician for the Seattle Seahawks, who said that the laws were necessary because there was no stickiness, quote-unquote stickiness, to education alone. And just putting this information out there in front of people wasn't enough, that we needed a law that was going to... Um, force people to, to abide by this. So uh, Stan and, a, and a, uh, an attorney and a number of other uh, people that really cared about this uh, just hit the ground running and they did what Stan calls this ABC uh, sort of equals patchwork of policies hitting community to community uh, sort of like we're doing here tonight. They just went out on the road and built this case for the state law. And uh, the essential components of all the state laws are that there's education, uh, that must be put in place for athletes, parents, and coaches. We just passed our law in North Carolina in uh, June of this past year. And uh, all athletes, parents, and coaches must sign off at the beginning of each season that they've read the concussion uh, signs and symptoms, they understand them, and they understand it's their responsibility to report these injuries. Uh, every uh, secondary school, middle school, and youth uh, uh, organized sport uh, in, for most of these state laws is required to have some sort of a concussion policy and an emergency action plan. Uh, no athlete can return to play on the same day uh, to a practice or a game uh, if there's a suspected concussion. And uh, no athlete can return to play without clearance by a medical uh, provider with training in concussion management. And I'd encourage you to look at the um, CDC's website. There is a very good, there are tools uh, on the CDC's website for parents, and it's called a concussion toolkit, uh, for coaches, a special one for coaches, for athletes, and now a new one that came out this past October for clinicians. It's called a clinician's uh, toolkit for concussion management. It's sort of the latest and greatest information about the management uh, of, this, uh, of this injury. So as I've said, there are 34 states now. Uh, Colorado, congratulations. You, uh, I'm not sure what number you are uh, among the 34, uh, but you're a blue state on our, on our map here, uh, which is great. We still need to have uh, uh, more states uh, uh, moving in that direction. Uh, 
it, this is the responsibility of everybody. Uh, when we ask whose responsibility is this going to take a community uh, of athletes, parents, physicians, uh, everybody that I've listed here, governing uh, bodies, uh, state, federal um, um, agencies, to come together to try to help protect uh, our youth athletes uh, so that uh, they don't suffer some of these late life consequences as a result of recurrent uh, brain injuries, and I want to emphasize brain injuries, uh, that we're uh, up at the resort uh, talking about this week. So in conclusion, uh, there's been this culture shift that's been set in motion, and uh, the education is key. Uh, parents, athletes, coaches, and medical professionals all must be educated regularly on this. We need to know the red flags uh, of, of something turning more catastrophic, where an athlete is deteriorating, uh, where that headache is intensifying, where uh, they just don't personality changes, their uh, sleep disorders, et cetera, where they need to be referred for potentially something more catastrophic uh, uh, developing. We need to establish compre uh, uh, objective comprehensive evaluation plans, and we need, I'm going to put a plug in, I am a certified athletic trainer, and I'm proud of that, and every single school in America should have a certified athletic trainer because they're on the front lines and they save lives, they're, uh, and, and they can put this plan in place. And unfortunately, right now, we only have about 48% of all school, secondary schools across the country have a certified athletic trainer, and that's a shame. So I hope that Colorado is ahead of that, uh, that, that, that uh, national mark of 48%. So I think state laws will make a difference, and uh, I thank you for your time. Well, uh, thank you again for inviting all of us to come speak here. Uh, it's impossible to give a, a quick introduction for many of the folks here, but I wanted to point out something that's uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, Kevin Guskowitz here uh, just received the Genius Award, um, which is highly coveted here uh, in uh, all of our fields of medicine. So uh, we appreciate all your good work. I'm sure it was because of my mentorship, but it, I, I don't want to go on about that. So, Yes, okay. Well, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about how we got to this issue of um, uh, mild traumatic brain injury and concussion. Uh, really, most of the work that, that has uh, been going on for the last 20 years actually came out of work uh, that we were very lucky, and I, I was lucky to stumble upon at University of Virginia uh, back in the 1980s. And that was when we were looking at the spectrum of closed head injury, and uh, we were uh, looking at the severes and moderates where we thought most of the action was. But at um, University of Virginia, we did a study of about uh, 1,200 people that came through our emergency rooms. We found that over 50% of those people that were in emergency rooms had mild traumatic brain injuries. And that got us to thinking we really maybe should look at this group a little further. We found out that a good uh, 30 three or four percent of that group of mild head injuries were not returning to work uh, three months post-injury, which was quite an interesting finding. So as a neuropsychologist, um, I wanted to study those folks. And at three-month follow-ups with this group of folks, we did a, uh, a, a pretty extensive neurocognitive assessment of them. And I know this doesn't, this slide probably doesn't make much sense to you, but um, uh, let's see here. Okay, there we go. Um, the, um, uh, you'll see here that uh, about 75% um, of the folks that we were testing neurocognitively, in fact, showed um, a, uh, a good neurocognitive profile. These are psychological and cognitive tasks that we gave them. Um, however, about 25% to 30% of those same people, those that were not, in fact, uh, returning uh, to their work, uh, had pretty significant neurocognitive deficits. And uh, this uh, was followed up by some animal models that showed that in a mild head injury in an animal, uh, you might in fact find some stretching and tearing of axonal fibers. So we, we felt we had a pretty interesting model here that maybe mild head injury was actually a problem since before that it was just considered a bump on the head and you'll get better uh, pretty quickly thereafter. Um, the problem with that kind of research is it's all epidemiological. 
And basically what that means to us is uh, we see how a person is functioning after their head injury, but we don't know what they looked like before their head injury. So their problems could have been there all along. So we decided we had to look into uh, uh, seeing what these people looked like before they got their injuries. And uh, that's a difficult thing to do. So uh, of course I'm at a u university uh, medical center. I have access to students. So I thought for sure I could go out and test those students with our neurocognitive measures and then maybe hit them with a two by four <laughs> and uh, check them out afterwards, do the same sort of testing. And uh, the uh, human investigations committees sort of frown on that sort of thing. They're, they're so picky. but. Uh, at any rate, we decided maybe we ought to look for people that are, are definitely going to get uh, head injuries, or we think they probably will. And uh, that's what brought us to football. And so we began the first studies of uh, uh, football players pre and, and uh, post concussion. So we did assessments at baseline, uh, and then uh, after they had a concussion that we uh, evaluated on the sideline, we would test them 24 hours later, five days later, and 10 days later, and then at the end of the season. Um, well, uh, you're uh, probably wondering why we need to do that sort of thing, why we couldn't just use normative samples to, to um, compare them to. But I'm reminded of a quote from uh, Joe Theismann, the uh, quarterback and commentator that said, uh, football players are not geniuses. Uh, geniuses are people like Norman Einstein. <laughs> and it says to me we need baseline testing of our athletes, see where they're really coming in to begin with. So at University of Virginia, we began our studies, uh, and we had to give it a sexy name, of course, so we call it SLAM. That's the Sports as a Laboratory Assessment Model. Um, and uh, uh, with our original research, we were able to enlist the uh, services of all of the Ivy League schools. Um, we had University of Virginia as well. And then I'm sure you're wondering, you know, are you going to really have real football players uh, involved in these studies? So we got uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, to join our study as well. And, uh, so we had 2,350 football players that we tested at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. And of those, you can see here, we had 195 concussions. These were very mild concussions in healthy young athletes. We also had control groups of uh, orthopedic or red-shirted players and student, uh, uh, students. What we found was that uh, on one of our neurocognitive tests, um, You'll see here that um, at the preseason, our players that in fact had uh, eventually gotten a concussion and the control group functioned at the same level on this particular test. And the test is, is designed to be um, one where you have to do some rapid mental processing. So you want the score to be low here. And this is about 47 uh, seconds it took both of these uh, groups to do this particular test. Um, 24 hours after injury, the injured players, it took them a little longer to do the task. And that doesn't look like much, except for the fact that the control group, we tested again, they had not had concussions, and lo and behold, they did better on this testing the second time around. And what we were finding here was the control group took advantage of the practice effect. In other words, they had been able to lay down memories of, of what they had done. And, and retain those. Um, five days later, we tested these players again, and we find that the practice effect begins to cut, um, uh, come in here to play. And as you can see here, uh, at uh, 10 days, uh, they're virtually the same. So we, what we had done here um, is uh, describe a recovery curve in neurocognitive sense. Uh, also, you can find the same sort of thing in symptoms. So we had uh, uh, headaches, and at preseason, 27% of the athletes complained of headaches. Uh, now, that, you might think that's unusual, but uh, players don't complain of much, but it's like, it's almost a badge of courage that they have headaches. They all have them, uh, they have them preseason and through the season. 
Um, however, after uh, an injury 24 hours later, 70% uh, or more, in fact, had headaches. Five days later, it's 54%, and finally at 10 days, they had made a pretty significant recovery. So um, this tells us that, um, that actually our, uh, our athletes make a pretty, pretty quick recovery, typically from one, one head injury, one concussion. There is a pretty rapid recovery in most cases, and that's somewhere between five and 10 days. The, uh, we have lots of other data to support this. This is the first study done. Um, virtually every other study since then has come in somewhere between three and 10 days in terms of recovery. So what should this mean for us for return to play? Do you hold everybody out for 10 days? Um, what about the outlier that's gonna take more than 10 days? Um, can you get some people recovering within two or three days and perhaps be able to play at that point? Well, there's lots of scientific data. These are the things we're talking about at this conference here uh, this week. Um, but probably the best things for you to know something about are um, the um, uh, consensus conferences uh, that have gone on, on over the years. And the most recent was the Zurich conference. Um, which talked about some of the individually based uh, decisions. And then what Kevin was just talking about is the issue of the NCAA uh, and the NFL uh, putting in place uh, good rules for uh, return to play. And that is that if you've had a concussion, um, it's been diagnosed as a concussion at the sidelines um, using all the tools we have to do that, um, that you should not go back into play that game or that practice and then you need to be evaluated by an appropriate healthcare professional to determine how you should be titrated back into play. Should you, in fact, have a rest period? Well, there's some controversy over that. Typically, most people say you should have a couple of days at least of, of pretty complete rest, and then you titrate in the activity. So um, a conservative approach to return to play based on some scientific evidence and what there is in the way of consensus would be the following things. Every player is different and decisions should be made on, uh, by the medical athletic training staff and with the player taking individual history into account. Uh, again, Kevin mentioned many of the things that can, can complicate a recovery. There's individual recovery curves that we need to take into account. Um, Players should be removed from play for that particular game and practice, and again reevaluated. When symptom free, it, it will likely be a good uh, time to do neurocognitive testing. Now, if you're lucky enough to have baseline testing there, and balance testing, which again uh, Kevin has has um, brought to the forefront for us, uh, if you have those things at baseline, you can do a, a, a follow up assessment as the person recovers to make sure they're reporting things appropriately. Uh, certainly, you, you will be asking the player, do you still have those headaches? Are you feeling dizzy? Um, do you have uh, any sensitivity to light? Those sorts of things. Well, we, we all know what happens there. Um, student athletes in particular are uh, going to want to hold that back. They're not going to want to tell you about that thing. So you need a, an objective measure of that recovery. So again, it's it's uh, uh, very important to consider getting baseline assessments done. Um, since there's no scientific evidence to support a cutoff for, for too many concussions in a season or a lifetime, decisions should be made by the medical athletic training staff, uh, taking into account, again, this individual history. You certainly have some people that have had two or three concussions and their, their third concussion uh, they, they seem to get better pretty quickly following a typical recovery curve. Uh, you do neurocognitive testing, they're back on, and, and maybe they can go on and, and continue to play. Uh, the old rule was three strikes and you're out, basically. It was called Quigley's rule. Um, nowadays, we, we can't apply just one rule to everybody. Um, however, you, you start to look at how that recovery uh, curve takes place. And, and with some individuals, that third concussion or even that second concussion can have a much longer recovery uh, curve. 
And when that begins to happen, we begin to worry about whether that person should be exposed again to a potential um, concussion. And, and when we get that concern, we, we take into account this last statement, and that is that we should do a much more complete uh, neurocognitive, neurological examination of that individual, balance testing, et cetera. So I want to switch gears just a little bit because uh, I think the title of all of these talks had the word combat uh, injury in it. Um, I've been involved, as has everybody else here, um, with the National Football League, uh, in my case, the Players Association, um, the uh, certainly college and high school athletics. Um, but I was lucky enough to be in on the ground floor of uh, the sports concussion research and the Department of Defense um, uh, came to me, as well as many other scientists, to, to talk about that impact. Is, is a sports concussion uh, the same thing as a blast uh, injury that they were experiencing in, uh, um, in Afghanistan and Iraq? Uh, of course, at the time, it seemed to me it must be about the same injury. And uh, so uh, we started working in these uh, consensus panels but after about six months of study on this issue and looking into the real dynamics of the injury, I found that it's a much more complicated uh, kind of problem. And that's because it, it has really four phases here, as you can see. The primary blast injury is one that uh, involves uh, atmospheric pressure. And in fact, it's two uh, portions of pressure. There's an at atmospheric overpressure, which is the blast that comes out and, and hits the individual. And then there is a, a vacuum that occurs right after that. So you can imagine what that would do. You have pressure and then you have a vacuum. So it's pulling things apart in essence. And the thing that it's going to affect most are hollow organs. So you get a lot of barotrauma, a lot of lung injuries, you get uh, ear injuries and that sort of thing. But remember, the brain is not one solid block here. Uh, you have a lot of cerebrospinal fluid and spaces in the brain. Um, and this overpressure, underpressure can in fact create uh, micro bubbles, uh, acute gas emboli, things that have nothing to do with sports related concussions uh, that we can see. So that's a first complicating factor, and it's the primary part of this um, injury. The secondary blast is when objects are thrown into the person. So they get hit with blunt objects. Um, uh, clearly, that's a little more like our sports injuries. That might be a bit like being tackled, but more like being hitting the ground and your, your head may be bouncing there. Um, but the, the tertiary uh, blast injury is the most like sports. And that's where the soldier is being placed into motion from the blast and then hits things, hits the ground, et cetera. Finally, there's a quaternary blast injury, and that's the burns and toxic fumes and crush injuries uh, that occur in these, uh, with these um, soldiers. So the blast injuries are, are much more complex. I think they can follow some of the same recovery cycles, um, but we're, we're now starting to get a handle on what actually happens in that blast. There are blast tubes they're using with animals to to see what actually happens to brain tissue uh, with these injuries. Um, so it's the primary, the complications are the primary overpressure basically and the secondary blunt injury. And that add on top of that, you've got a whole nother set of problems to deal with, particularly if you're a clinician trying to deal with this. With a, with a sports concussion, you've got limited factors because most of the time you have a young, healthy, motivated uh, athlete that you're dealing with uh, so the chances for recovery and, and not having a bunch of individual vulnerabilities like substance abuse and, and previous uh, depression and those sorts of things are not there. With this group, we also have the new complicating factor of post-traumatic stress disorder. These, these um, men and women are constantly stressed through the day, and it's not just from these blasts, it's from everything. They are up seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, so this uh, uh, causes some problem with, um, uh, in fact, treating these injuries, and you need to treat them differently than sports injuries. How, how is the military treating them now? 
in the sand, basically over there. Um, if a person is exposed to a uh, concussive blast injury or a rollover accident, um, and that exposure with blast injury is considered uh, 50 meters, anywhere within 50 meters of the blast, they are um, immediately, as soon as they can, they're taken back to their, to their, um, uh, their unit uh, where their line medic uh, essentially screens them to find out if they have any symptoms from concussion. They use a thing called the MACE, Military Acute uh, Concussion Examination. Um, and so they try to determine if they've had a concussion and if they have had a concussion or even a, just an exposure and they're not sure, that person gets two days of rest and, and observation and they work with a battle buddy actually at that point. Um, if they recover from all their symptoms and they pass the mace again, they can go back to duty. So remember, back to duty and back to play are little different things here. Um, we've, we've got the, the mission of sports is to win a game, but the, the, uh, um, uh, the cost uh, in the military is quite different. Uh, they need those guys back in action, so there's a push, of course, to get them back. Fortunately, they've been listening to the scientific community to say, don't push them back too fast because you may never have them back if they have another injury uh, like this. Uh, if the person doesn't clear in two days, they're sent to an, another level of a low-level hospital where they, uh, in fact, their concussion uh, treatment centers where they get rest and titrated in exercise for about 14 days. Um, after that, of course, they're given more uh, complete assessment if they haven't gotten better and they're, they're, uh, um, uh, their symptoms are still there. And finally, they're sent to the main military hospitals or back into uh, the continental United States. So I think I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you for listening. I'd like to uh, also uh, thank the organizers for uh, offering me the opportunity to speak. Uh, most of us will <clears throat> speak about what we do at the drop of a hat uh, or a ski mask. And um, also, congratulate Kevin publicly. The MacArthur Fellowships, the Genius Awards, are very hard to get, very prestigious. You've got to be a Norman Einstein to get one. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Kevin is one of the newly celebrated 2011 fellows. Uh, I'm going to try in a couple of minutes to give you a two-for-one because you need to know something about Alzheimer's disease in order to understand why at this meeting up the road, about 50% to 60% of the people attending this meeting on traumatic brain injury are either recovering Alzheimer's researchers or current Alzheimer's researchers. And at the meeting next door, which is about Alzheimer's disease and the specific effects of a lipoprotein, it's half lipid, half protein, called an apolipoprotein, that there's one that's a variant that has an effect of causing or uh, increasing the chances of developing Alzheimer's disease. And those people at that meeting talking about the effects of APOE on Alzheimer's disease keep running into our meeting because APOE is also a risk factor for trauma. Um, it was no accident that uh, these two meetings were scheduled together. So I'm going to try and talk a bit about what the central questions are about um, kind of a 30,000 foot view of traumatic brain injury as an entity, uh, you've got more specific pieces which are more of direct clinical concern from our first two speakers, then give you uh, what I hope is a five slide uh, primer on Alzheimer's disease and then return so you'll see, I hope, why we are so concerned about issues across genetics, Alzheimer's disease, and um, this new entity that we has kind of burst onto the scene with uh, football and uh, other chronic injuries called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, these are my uh, commercial disclosures, which uh, I uh, give at every meeting. I regret to say that none of them are, uh, these are all for Alzheimer's disease, none of them are sufficient that I couldn't do a research study or anything um, uh, that involve one of these companies, just they don't pay you enough money to do that. But here are the things that I want to talk about today. Um, there are short and long-term outcomes of interest in traumatic brain injury. We have, most of us think about, okay, how fast can we get better from a TBI? But it turns out that there are some long-term issues that we are very concerned about. The outcomes differ depending on whether you have had single or multiple injuries uh, and the age at which you suffer the injury. 
the brain changes that occur in short-term and long-term TBI are different. And the long-term TBI outcomes are of three types. I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, tissue injury and neuropathology as we go through uh, our discussion. The first is the one that I think most of us would probably think about, have seen in the movies, with people who suffer severe traumatic brain injury, perhaps an open injury where there's a skull fracture and bleeding and so forth. And these are people who are severely injured and have a long uh, course of rehabilitation and uh, eventually get back uh, the ability to walk, some degree of um, uh, cognition comes back, perhaps not all the way back to what they were before the injury, and they may have behavioral problems. They may have uh, uh, episodic uh, uh, upset or anger, be easily riled, may have cognitive problems such as memory loss or what we call executive function, uh, uh, inability to plan for the future, impaired motivation, impaired insight. And that's the typical thing we think about. Severe head injury, slow recovery, may or may not get back to normal. But then there is this new entity of uh, what are repeated uh, injuries to the brain. Uh, at least we believe that for the most part it's repeated injuries to the brain called chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, in which there is clinical improvement. And you've heard those uh, improvements uh, described by, by both uh, Kevin uh, and uh, Jeff. Uh, but in this case, later in life, cognitive decline comes on. And we'll talk about the relationships of the brain changes to those cognitive declines in a minute. And finally, uh, the knowledge that we've had for about 15 or years now, that a single severe uh, TBI with loss of consciousness of 30 minutes or greater results in an increased likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease in late life. Not a guarantee, but an increased possibility of AD, not chronic traumatic uh, uh, encephalopathy, but Alzheimer's disease itself. So why would we think they're related? Well, TBI's got half of the pathological markers in the brain that Alzheimer's disease does. Alzheimer's disease has what are called amyloid plaques, and I'll show you these in a minute in the brain, and what are called neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, TBI has an elevation of amyloid immediately after the injury, uh, but then that, we think, uh, goes away. But in the long term, neurofibrillary tangles are found in the brain, although in a different distribution than the, in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. Both Alzheimer's disease and TBI have a worse outcome and are more likely to occur if you carry a particular a gene variant, a particular allele, as it's called, of the apolipoprotein E molecule. Perversely, there are three alleles, three variants of the apolipoprotein E gene. They are called E2, E3, and E4. Um, there is no E1. There's a long story behind that, but just think there's two, three, four. And four is the one that appears to increase the risk, and we even know why it increases the risk. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease for a minute. The woman you see there is Augusta Dieter, who presented to Alzheimer at age 49 in uh, Germany in uh, around the turn of the 20th century. She had memory loss, disturbances in language, visual spatial deficits. Uh, she had trouble uh, with insight, impaired motivation. Uh, she had decreased social cognition. She didn't get it when she was in a discussion with the doctor and her husband. And she also had depression and anxiety uh, and uh, a psychosis. She had paranoia. Uh, she was diagnosed as Alzheimer's original case, as you know, and the the thing to know is that the anatomy and the circuitry that underlies most of the symptoms that she had, that our Alzheimer patients all have, uh, we now know, thanks to 20 years of intense work, we got serious about this disease in around 1985. And the makeup of plaques and tangles have also been identified. These up in the corner are the sketches that Alzheimer did of the curious, black, ropey, thick, fibers that he saw in the nerve cells of Augusta D. These are what we call neurofibrillary tangles, and I'll talk to you about how they form and what they're made of and what they mean. Here's a picture showing one conveniently right next to a plaque on the left side. That neuron <clears throat> is filled with neurofibrillary tangles. It is a normal protein, tau, which has had extra phosphorus groups, put on, phosphate groups put onto it, and has linked itself together, basically transformed itself as a protein so that it is highly insoluble. 
It's a piece of insoluble glop sitting inside a nerve cell. And eventually it will result in the death of the cell, if not severe impairment first. Next to it is what he saw and described as a neuritic plaque. We now refer to them as, um, sorry, he referred to it as a senile plaque. We refer to them now as neuritic plaques. And this has a small peptide, a peptide, remember, is a tiny little protein, surrounded by an inflammatory surround. Basically, the brain recognizes this pile up of this little protein, which groups itself together in the bright white or the antibody to it, showing you those red glops on the right side. And the brain tries to get rid of it, but it can't. So it causes an inflammatory surround around the plaques themselves. Now, and we know that amyloid plaques form decades before any of the clinical changes or neurofibrillary tangles begin to form. So we believe the disease is kicked off by the presence of amyloid, and I'll show you more about that in a moment. This is the part that you probably know the most about, the clinical progression of the disease that you can read about almost weekly now, that for a long period of time, probably at least a decade of pre-symptomatic time, the effects of genes, of environment, of uh, environment including traumatic brain injury, of lifestyle, all combine uh, to cause the disease's pathology to come on. And that at some point people recognize there's something wrong with them, but if they're older, it may be normal aging. We can't tell those apart uh, purely clinically very easily. But then when one problem, usually short-term memory, gets bad enough that it's abnormal, that is what we call mild cognitive impairment. A dementia diagnosis, and in this case, Alzheimer's disease that we're talking about, can only be diagnosed when there are two areas of thinking function, what we call cognitive domains that are abnormal. So a memory problem is an amnesia, but a memory problem plus a language problem or plus an executive function problem qualifies to be a dementia. You need two cognitive domains that are abnormal. And this takes place, we now think about this disease as a continuum. We no longer think of it as something that suddenly presents to the physician. Uh, with, of course, a three to four or five year history of when symptoms first began. We know now it started decades before, and we are going to be able to identify people pre-symptomatically within a very short period of time. Where does this trouble all come from? It comes from a protein called amyloid precursor protein. We don't know exactly what this protein does in the brain, but it's a protein that sits on a membrane, and a long part sticks up above the surface of the membrane, and a short tail is inside. If you can think of it as a blade of grass, normally what happens is the long external blade is cut just above the surface. Let's see if I can get this to move around so you can see where it says the alpha site, and this black line right here is where it's normally cut. And what is when that is cut, this long piece called soluble APP uh, is actually a trophin. It, its neurons like to grow on it. It has some characteristics of a uh, uh, of a, uh, a substrate that the brain can grow, that axons, the, the business end of the neuron, uh, can grow on. The problem is that the peptide that I showed you in those pictures, that bright white spot, is made up of little fragments of the orange length, which means that that cut never occurred, and the two more enzymes, both of which were predicted before they were actually identified in the brain, had to be present in the human brain. One is called base, and that makes the cut at the top of the orange uh, uh, protein, and the other is called gamma secretase, fancy long name, uh, and it actually makes its cut in the middle of the membrane, something we've never seen before. The important thing to know about gamma secretase, and the reason that I tell you this detail, is that gamma secretase is made up of four proteins that all kind of line up together in the membrane, one of which, called presenilin-1, if a mutation or mistake occurs in it, causes Alzheimer's disease in families. 50% of every generation, if they inherit the gene, will develop Alzheimer's disease. We now can see amyloid plaques in the brain on a scan. This particular scan, there are three current ones in common use experimentally. Uh, this was the first to be developed. It was developed at Pittsburgh uh, while I was there. It's called Pittsburgh Compound B. There's a great story about Compound A, by the way, we won't talk about today. But PIB, as it's known, as you can see, can identify plaques in the brains of humans, non-invasively. This is a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan. So on the outside, you see two 70-year-old men um, showing mild atrophy of the brain on both sides. And in the middle, you see on the right, the control, where there's no uptake of this particular tracer. 
but here it hangs up because it binds, it was made to bind specifically to amyloid plaque. So there's no question we can see this in the brains of people non-invasively, whether, regardless of whether they have an abnormality in their thinking function or not. So not only could we use this for diagnosis, it was actually invented to try and find, track how drugs work in pulling amyloid out of the brain, if we're gonna be able to do that, uh, and those studies are underway. Here's an example in two people that I just put in to show you normals who are being observed longitudinally over time, and here's their base shot in one year on the left of one person who you can see had a significant buildup between uh, the first scan and the second, and on the right, three years difference, between the, especially in the frontal lobe uh, of another uh, man, both still having normal cognition. So this is Alzheimer's disease coming kind of like having arthritis in your knee that you never knew was there because it didn't hurt, and one day you have a, an x-ray because you pay a visit to uh, one of our uh, local colleagues who says, uh, you know, there's some arthritis in that leg. Well, I didn't know I had arthritis in that leg. It never hurt me. So this is the equivalent of that, the pre-symptomatic manifestation of the disease. Now, neurofibrillary tangles, I told you, we end up with a protein called tau protein, and tau you can think of as the railroad ties on a railroad track. They hold what are called microtubules, that's the steel rail, in place so that the materials that the nerve cell, those long processes needs, can go back and forth. Sends out things, brings back junk, sends out more proteins, brings back things that have to report back to the central nerve cell. But if tau is not working right, if, it is, if it's excessively phosphorylated, or certainly if it's bound to itself and irreversibly stuck together, then it loses its ability, and what happens is the microtubules break apart. Just as if you went ahead and cut the ties in a railroad track, the ties would splay and the train's not coming down the track. So when you see neurofibrillary tangles, that's dysfunction of that neuron at some level, and eventually it would cause the death of the cell when the cell fills up with it, as I showed you. Now, like amyloid that we know begins years before the um, uh, cognitive changes ever occur in people with Alzheimer's disease, we don't know exactly when neurofibrillary tangles begin to start, but they are much more closely correlated with clinical abnormalities, with the begins, begin, beginnings of the decrease in cognition uh, in humans, uh, whereas amyloid does not have that kind of strong correlation. It can't. I just told you, it builds up for years before any clinical manifestations occur. But we do know that neurofibrillary tangles always start in the same area of the brain, in an area called the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. If the human brain has a RAM chip, that area is it. It's in charge of short-term memory, and you can see it in the second picture down where the red uh, 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 highlight is. And then you see that it spreads from that area of the middle temporal lobe where memory lives out onto the sides of the brain and the temporal lobes, up into the frontal lobes, and then into the parietal lobes in the back. We don't know why it goes in that particular direction. We think it has something to do with the connectivity of the cells, but what we do know is that after patients die, since we can't see this in living humans like we can see amyloid, there's a strong correlation between how cognitively impaired someone is and how many of these tangles they have in their brains. And here's where the interesting genetic factor comes in. Um, I told you that there are a couple of mutations or mistakes in the brain, in, in genes that can occur that cause Alzheimer's disease. And the big news about them is that all three of the ones we found, there are three separate genes, all three are in proteins that directly affect amyloid metabolism. In fact, one of them is the amyloid precursor protein itself. That was the first one discovered in the 1990s. But in addition to those causative mistakes in um, uh, amyloid metabolism-related proteins, there is apolipoprotein E, which, if you have one variant, the four variant, appears to increase the chances that you will develop the disease. In a normal Caucasian population, um, if you have 50 people over here on this side, that means since each of you got a gene from mom and a gene from dad, there are 100 alleles, as we call them. If you look in a normal Caucasian population, about 77% of the alleles will be of this, uh, what's called E2. A slightly different one, they all differ by one peptide, uh, or one amino acid, 79% E3, that's kind of like the brown eyes of apolipoprotein E, 
and then about 14% have E4. That translates, by the way, to about 22% of the Caucasian population having one E4, so you might be a 4-3, and 2% of the population having, uh, being a 4-4, being homozygous for the 4. So that's the population on the left. But if you look at what comes into clinics in the United States and Europe and everywhere else it's look, we have looked, somewhere between 40 and 50, and I heard today 60% of people who come in with AD have are E4 carriers. And that means that something about E4 or something near it, we now know it's E4 and not something that's right next to it on the uh, chromosome, something about E4 appears to increase the risk that you'll develop the disease. Now, we have a number of mechanisms, but by far the biggest one is the fact that if you make your apolipoprotein E out of the E4 allele, that protein, which normally removes beta amyloid from the brain and takes it out to the circulation to be metabolized, isn't as efficient. It's a slow mover. So if you think about the fact that you have something else that must go wrong, genes, environment, heredity, what I showed you before, and you happen to inherit a slow moving uh, carrier of amyloid, that over the space of 15 to 20 years, you may slowly build amyloid up and then it somehow, we don't know exactly how yet, appears to trip the formation of neurofibrillary tangles. And when they become widespread enough, you have the memory loss and the other kinds of changes uh, that we see. There also appear to be other effects of APOE itself directly that may cause the disease or cause damage that makes the disease manifest itself. Uh, it has effects that are neurotoxic itself. It can interfere with the health of the synapses, the connections between one cell to another to prevent it from for the brain from talking to itself. And it also may have effects on energy metabolism. But the E4 is a big issue, and the fact that the E4 uh, lipoprotein itself is a bad carrier and would let amyloid build up in the brain until finally it trips these changes in neurofibrillary tangles are the key things to remember that has everybody excited when you turn back to look at neurofibrillary at, uh, at, at trauma. Together, they're a nightmare. So if you have Alzheimer's disease, if you, your risk of Alzheimer's disease is, is increased about threefold if you have one E4 allele. It's increased 12-fold if you have uh, two, uh, if you're a 4-4, if you're homozygous. If you have an E4, a single E4, and you have a severe head trauma, your chances of developing Alzheimer's disease are increased tenfold. So there's a combination of things that can absolutely happen to say a combination of genetics and in this case the environmental trauma greatly increases the chances that you will develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, I've just told you about the, uh, these data. Boxers, repetitive injury, I said one of the three kinds of long-term things that happen to you. Boxers, it turns out, who have one E4 allele, uh, you can't see it from there, but you can see it on the right, the big black bar in boxers who do a lot of boxing, that's how much brain damage is done to them compared to the boxers next to them, the gray uh, one that's only about half the height of the black one, who don't carry E4 alleles. So clearly if you have an E4 allele, if your brain gets bonked, your brain does not respond to it as well as if you don't carry it, as if you carry the common kind, the, what's called the E3. And uh, if we have to predict, we would say that although this is in boxers, the pathology in boxers and the pathology in football players who have repetitive injuries is identical. In fact, the first case that we looked at in Pittsburgh when we showed it to the neuropathologist after staining it for amyloid and tangles, there wasn't much amyloid there, but there were lots of tangles in a different kind of position. First thing he said was, uh, we told him this was a mystery case because we didn't want to prejudice him, he said, was this man a boxer? Now, this is a, uh, a, a kind of a 30,000 foot view showing you that with traumatic brain injury, um, you get diffuse injury to the connectivity to the axons that are talking to all over the brain one to another. Uh, you have mechanical tissue damage as uh, was described by my colleagues. Uh, and you have uh, uh, loss of synapses, loss of connectivity, uh, as well as uh, neuronal dysfunction and sometimes cell death right away depending on how severe the injury is. And you can have that with a mild fall in which in case you don't have very much of those kinds of changes, but it may result in memory loss and uh, depression and other kinds of clinical symptoms that goes away after a couple of weeks, the equivalent of one of the concussions that uh, uh, Kevin and, and Jeff talked about. 
But if you continue to have it, if you have mild repeated episodes of this, such as a boxer or a football player, then the pathology appears to be different. Then what happens is you begin to accumulate neurofibrillary tangles. Not in the same place as Alzheimer's disease, but in the surface of the brain. And then as it progresses, it moves down inside. Same tangles, but not with any amyloid that you see under the microscope. And with the same, it appears, propensity if you have an E4 allele, that you're more likely to develop this kind of symptom. And the third type is over there with a single severe injury is somebody who has Alzheimer's disease, uh, who, who has a severe injury, knocked out for 30 minutes or more, gets better, later in life presents with AD. Those, that last group, and they're the group who are more likely if they have E4 to have this happen to them, probably were people who were developing Alzheimer's disease anyway but who suffered an injury that synapses die, cells get torn. They lost some of what we call our, their cognitive reserve. So if they were destined to develop their Alzheimer's disease, say at age 75, they may develop it at age 67 or 68. And that's pretty much what it looks like. The people with trauma and Alzheimer's have the curve of starting up of when they get their disease that looks like it's shifted back about seven or eight years from people who had no history of head trauma with the rates at which, or the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease increasing in the population. I'll tell you about the first case we saw, Mike Webster, Iron Mike, as he was known to Pittsburgh Steeler fans. He played in college at Wisconsin. He played high school, of course. He played 16 years in the NFL. Um, he died in, 19, in 2002 at age 50. Uh, for years prior to death, he had depression, short-term memory loss, uh, uh, episodic anger, uh, and some other neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, he was the one who, when it was taken to the pathologist, said, gee, is this man a boxer? Uh, and that's how we kind of reestablished the fact that, and the reason it was named chronic traumatic encephalopathy by Amalu was because he didn't want people to confuse the idea that people who didn't box could have the same kinds of pathology, uh, but they needed a better label. And the pathology, as I said, is neurofibrillary tangles uh, with a different distribution of where they are in the brain, but no plaques. So why does this disease have tangles without plaques? Um, well, what we think, and I'm not sure I put those in yet, what we think is that amyloid, which is upregulated in the brain with injury, we don't know how much and little injury, but we know it happens, may start pushing the same kinds of neurofibrillary tangle pathology that happens over a long period of time in Alzheimer's disease with repetitive pulses in young people. But there's nothing wrong in most of them with their ability to get that out of the brain. And so by the time someone shows up with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the amyloid's been removed, but the tangles are still there. And because the pathology was trauma and not the metabolic changes of developing uh, too much amyloid in the brain, the distribution of tangles is different. So contact sports are all at risk for these sorts of things, although we believe soccer is probably at less at risk, uh, to head off that first question. Um, in boxing, the longer you box, number of rounds, the more likely you are to end up with punch drunk syndrome, as many of you heard it called, dementia pugilistica or boxing dementia. And um, we can see if you take boxers and just box a few rounds and do a spinal tap, you can see evidence of neurofilaments and uh, tau protein in the spinal fluid, elevated levels in the spinal fluid after a boxing match. The Swedes, of course, do this because they do lumbar punctures on tons of people, get great data. But it shows that, in fact, you damage the brain, as you expect, when you box. And the severity of impairment in boxers, as I said, also related to APOE. So the acute single incident, such as an auto accident, we believe relates to a sudden upregulation of amyloid in addition to whatever brain damage is done just by the physical trauma to the brain. That set of plaques that you see down in the corner is from a 32-year-old who was removed because of a clot that was underneath the tissue in his temporal lobe two hours after the accident occurred. So this isn't somebody who is developing Alzheimer's disease. This is a young person who's got a lot of plaque in his brain, and we see this in animals as well. They upregulate and may form plaques after experimental injury. And now we think that with the repetitive uh, injury, the chronic pathology is neurofibrillary tangle-based. Um, it also may lead to Parkinsonism because you, we see these tangles in the parts of the base of the brain where Parkinson's disease emanates from, and also motor neuron disease, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, if you remember. And we were taught 20 or 30 years ago that one of the risk factors for ALS was, in fact, athletes. 
being an athlete was associated with it. Boxers had also had it in addition to dementia pugilistica. So one of the hypotheses to work on is that long-term neurofibrillary tangle formation may be due to repeated upregulation of amyloid that starts that neurofibrillary uh, tangle pathology cascade down the line. Why would I make such a point of this? Because for Alzheimer's disease, most of you know that there are a lot of treatments of Alzheimer's disease based on trying to either block the formation of beta amyloid or remove it with vaccines or with antibodies that are infused, or enzyme inhibitors that stop the protein from being cut in the wrong place. And now those guns for Alzheimer's disease research are in studies in animals with experimental trauma and will be coming in all likelihood to people with severe brain injury uh, within, I would suspect, the next five to seven years. So we have some un um, unexpected, I would say, aid from the Alzheimer's therapeutic world to try in people who are, uh, are at risk, perhaps, for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and perhaps for those who have some, and we can tell in all of these people whether they have amyloid plaques still in their brain or not because we have the PET scan that allows us to visualize it. And the first of the long-term, uh, of the uh, tracers to identify in living humans harmlessly neurofibrillary tangles are just now coming out of the laboratories. So I would suspect that within a decade, we'd be able to see amyloid in the brain, we'd be able to see neurofibrillary tangles, we will have drugs that will probably be aimed both at Alzheimer's and at CTE to, or at people status post-trauma, depending on uh, what stage uh, they come to uh, 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 care. Uh, and my hope is that this will do something to stop the current rash of uh, these risks, outco uh, risks of outcome uh, from a cognition uh, standpoint and a neuropsychiatric standpoint. So that's a lot to swallow, but giving you a little bit of Alzheimer's and a little bit of TBI path in the same talk uh, was, uh, I don't know why I said yes, I would do that, uh, but I, I, I hope I've given you some sense of where this is. Thanks very much. We've run over a little bit of time, but John, would you like to just say a few words about what types of injuries you see in the in this uh, in this county? And sure. I actually got interested in this for a couple of reasons because of the changes in the laws here. First started with Chass about three years ago. The high school got into the rules and regulations about that athletes had to be cleared before they went back, and then the Jake Snakenberg law that just got passed January came into effect January first, and so now all athletes that are must be pulled from the field if they have an injury and then return back. And then as an attending physician of the Copper Mountain Medical Clinic, I'm seeing a lot of head injuries, particularly this year with the hard snow. I mean, there are days I've worked where 40% of the patients I see have a head injury. Um, and in my private practice, I'm seeing between one and four head injuries a day, either for initial evaluation or for follow-up and clearance and go back to sports. So all this wonderful science is sort of I'm being used to try and implement that into how we get the athlete back and the return to play protocols and using symptom scores, which is really with a big thing that we're using before we get them back and neurocognitive testing and some in Eagle County, at least all of the athletes all have baseline impact tests done prior to them uh, participating in any sports, so all the hockey players, soccer players, basketball players, and of course for everybody here, it's the skiers, um, and all the US ski team requires that too. They, have, they must have yearly impacts done. So we have some cognitive kinds of tools that we can use. They're not foolproof, but they at least give us a, a helping hand in terms of how to treat these athletes and getting them back to their exercise. Um, and we've been working on modified return to play protocols because unfortunately we don't have some of the athletic trainers to be able to be the monitors and so how we do that and we've sort of divided up return to play protocols into sort of three steps an initial aerobic return to play protocol so they go through that and then if they do that symptom free then they return to practice and if they do that then a return to competition so as we've divided up into sort of three areas to allow us when we don't have athletic trainers on the field. Some of the sports do, some of them don't, so we have to do that. Um, and I think we would really want to get to some questions from the sure. audience. Sure. So um, I think that what we can do maybe for the next few minutes is, is have some questions from the audience, and they'll just uh, decide on their own who's, uh, who's going to take an answer. So <laughs> if we have any. Thank you. I think this is probably for Dr. Koski. How does one find out if they have an E4 allele? 
Well, you can, you can find out. Uh, there's a, a commercial test available that your doctor could do to tell you what your genotype is. I would think carefully about doing it. Um, and the reason is that uh, just as we do not tell people what their sc scan shows, whether they have amyloid or not, and everybody knows that as part of the protocol for being scanned, because there is no therapy that would devolve from it, because we could tell you everything you should do right now without doing your uh, APOE. And remember that 50% of the people who get the disease don't carry the E4. That uh, for the most part, we don't recommend that people get the, the, the test done. Uh, what it has done is told us that there is a door through which we can go for therapies as a result of this. There are medicines actually we heard about last night that change the E4 APOE into an E3-like formation so that it stops the problems that it causes in, in what we think is the cascade. But I would not have the genetic testing done uh, just to see if you have one, because if you have it, you'll be sure that you're doomed and you're not. <laughs> and if you don't have it, you'll be sure that you're spared and you're not, 50-50. Thank you. I um, sustained a month ago a small but not insignificant subdural hematoma, skiing. Uh, it was on one of the days when there was snow, and, uh, but I bounced the left side, the, 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 uh, the tem temporal area of my head off the ground. Uh, fortunately, had, a, had a, a good helmet on. I didn't pass out. I got right up and skied another hour and a half, had no problems. I'm a retired doctor, so about five or six hours later at home, when I began to develop a mild headache, it was only a grade two to three out of ten, but it was different. It wasn't, wasn't sinus, wasn't hypertension, it was a little deeper on that side. I decided before I skied the next day, I would go ahead to the ER and um, got a, a CT scan, which showed, again, a significant subdural. My, my, and I never got a bad headache. My headache the next four or five days was maybe a four to five out of ten. My question is, what percentage of the of the kids of, uh, that come in with a, a, co a con concussion or had get CT scans. If I hadn't had a CT scan, I probably would have continued skiing and Lord knows what might have happened. So uh, I've been part of a number of the practice parameters that have been developed, uh, the National Athletic Trainers Association, the American College of Sports Medicine, the uh, AAN's new guidelines. And we don't recommend uh, imaging uh, we, we probably image one in 15 of our concussions uh, at, at uh, UNC and for our high school athletes. And those are ones who are deteriorating over the initial 24 to 48 hours. So uh, this is, it's, I always tell people, just don't assume it's that typical concussion. So it's, it's sort of what you experienced uh, that day. You just didn't seem right. The headache maybe is intensifying. The uh, pr pressure being placed there that's pushing them down uh, sort of into a... Um, um, a sort of more lethargic state, uh, semi-comatose state, then eventually if, if, if this thing's not captured soon enough. But we, uh, we don't image many of them, and uh, the, even the ones we do, we see it very few uh, times it is positive. You wouldn't have known. And... Yeah, you had you had a, a a development of symptoms after a while, and we would, yes, but uh, that would be enough to to signal to anybody that you at least should be checked out. And when in doubt, in, in my view, in emergency rooms, they're going to give you a CT scan at that point. Uh, as Kevin points out, though, most people don't have developing symptoms over time. It's usually a a, a decline in those symptoms. Uh, and and in fact, if you had had then further symptoms such as a bit of confusion, you kept, you know, then it would have been automatic. I mean, part of it is you were never originally evaluated. If you'd been originally evaluated, the couple things you would have looked at, you know, I'd seen you, you would have gotten some, a symptom score to follow. If your symptoms were deteriorating, that would have been a sign for you to be reevaluated, number one. Number two, age has a big thing to do with it, too. You know, you know, we've done a study over at Copper Mountain. I mean, at Summit Medical Center, we have over 400 
admissions with negative CT scans with normal neurologic exams because they got CTs. Some of the outlying clinics where they don't have CT scans, they're not getting eva they're getting evaluated by observation, and then only if they deteriorate, they get a CT scan. Um, and I think the criteria for CT is 55, 50 or 55, isn't it? That's sort of the age that we're using is, you know, you get a lot more careful if you're over 50, 55 years of age. And then, you know, are you on anticoagulants? You know, are you taking your daily aspirin? All those kinds of things are, are factors that contribute whether you would get it. There are some negative factors for doing CAT scans. There was a study, done, I think in Sweden, where they looked at twins who had had CAT scans done uh, from falling out of bed at age two or less. And 50% of the, uh, I mean, so one of the two twins got scanned. Okay, the kid that got scanned was 20% less likely to go on to college in that study. CAT scans are not benign, you know, they're not benign things to have. There's a fair amount of radiation with that. So you don't want to just do one just because it's there. Uh, okay, I just have a question. My husband has had a subdural hematoma on his left hand side of his brain. And my question is, why does an individual's percent of uh, recurrence of injury increase after a brain injury and about the age factor? Dan had this about four years ago? About four years ago. So those at 55, okay? So those are the two questions. Uh, I'm not sure what the question is about the age factor. The first the answer to the first question, someone who has a subdural hematoma, recurrence is statistically more likely because you clot, you uh, remove slowly the fluid that's accumulated, and you have some scar tissue up there. The, the, uh, the membranes all thicken. There are blood vessels that are part of the scar tissue. If you bang them around, they're a little more fragile because they are newer, and they will be more likely to tear again and cause another subdural hematoma. Uh, if uh, you're subjected to uh, sometimes even relatively mild trauma. So the, the moral of the story is, and everybody gets told this, if you have one, then you need to be extra careful and be on alert, as we have talked about here before, especially if you are over a certain age. Um, there's no uh, specific uh, age cutoff, although 55 sounds like the, the likely one to me. And one of the reasons for that is that the, the brain shrinks a little bit as you get older, just like uh, people get wrinkles and, and lose their hair as they get older. <laughs> and so the vessels that come down from the top as the brain shrinks are stretched a little bit. Instead of kind of lying loose where if they get jolted, they just kind of move around, they're now stretched like this. And if the brain gets hit and they're sheared, they are more likely to uh, tear and cause a subdural. And that's why older people are at greater risk of suffering subdural hematomas than young people whose brains are close up to the inner table of the skull and the vessels are not under any stretch. Thank you. You've shown the uh, relationship between repetitive TBI and Alzheimer's. I wonder if you have any data on the relationship between trauma-induced watershed ischemia and Alzheimer's. No, uh, watershed ischemia, that's uh, low blood flow to areas of the brain that kind of sit in between where the main distribution of major arteries come up into the brain, the place in between as the vessels get smaller and smaller that don't get a lot of blood flow are at risk to become ischemic or even have a stroke. But I'm not aware of any relationship between uh, Oh, sorry, I take that back. Between Alzheimer's and, and that, I do not know. In brains where there is swelling and there's increased pressure inside the skull, that area, because pressure may interfere with blood flow up to the head, there may be a decrease in the amount that comes into that watershed zone, which travels kind of right along the middle. That's the only relationship that I'm aware of. I don't know of a relationship with Alzheimer's disease and watershed. Thank you. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank our guests <clears throat> for taking some time out of this evening and, and uh, coming down here and talking to us. So how about a round of applause? Thanks.